Так вот, не люблю, а на церемонии. Okay, so uh, are we uh, five past or that's yeah. enough? Or? Yeah, we have like two minutes, I guess. Okay. Let's wait to see if anyone else wants to turn up today. Hey, Scott. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, and I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you guys. I told my 1014 class, but I didn't say it to you guys. I, um, yeah, I, um, I should, yes. I, today's going to be a disaster. Uh, because the hour, the meeting that was meant to go for two hours this morning, which was the reason why I couldn't come to office hours, is still going on over there. <laughs> and I ducked out of it just a moment ago to come for, over for here. 10, 14. No, no, this is a, oh. um, the, this meeting is about the PhD scholarship. For international students. Yes, international yeah. students. So it was, it's the giant bun fight between yep. all the different schools oh. and the College of Science over who gets their PhD scholarships funded. Um, so it's entertaining, but uh, takes a long time apparently. Uh, but it does mean that instead of spending some time thinking about what I was going to say to you guys today. I uh, was having a bun fight for the scholarship. Uh, did so you win? We actually surprisingly did very well. Yeah. Um, How many scholarships? So it used to be that the international scholarships, there were basically just four of in the sciences each year, yeah. which is infinitesimally small. Yeah. Uh, this year, happily, there's 15. Yeah. So the, but I mean, that, is, that said, that's essentially at the expense of domestic scholarships. So really? It's really, that money got diverted away from domestic PhD students to international students. Uh, for the math department, this isn't a disaster because nearly all of the people we put into the domestic round for scholarships are ranked very highly and are going to get their scholarships anyway, <laughs> even with the reduced funding. Whereas on the international side, we n almost never fell into the top four, but it seems that we're quite consistent in getting into the top 16. <laughs> so I think it's actually going to work well for us. But in the the big difference is just that the, the other college, the other science schools are very, very enthusiastic about getting international students. Um, whereas I think we're, uh, we, I mean, the big difference is that in the, all the other sciences, they need workers in their labs and they, you know, for yeah, them, have that for them, sort of thing for them that. recruiting <laughs> students is a much bigger deal than it is for us, where the students aren't, aren't sort of making the research projects happen. They're sort of, Parallel to the research projects that might be doing. Anyway. Okay. So, would you have time after this lecture for some questions? Um, yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry again. No, okay. So, we're sort of in the middle of, of studying some things about uh, the spectrum. And I think that where we had got to was we were partway through proving, or we were most of the way proving this theorem, uh, that for, uh, for T uh, bounded and self-adjoint, uh, the norm of T uh, is, actually, uh, is actually just a maximum okay, absolute value of a point in the spectrum. And if you remember, some of the preambles to this theorem included a proof that the spectrum uh, for a self-adjoint operator was a compact subset of the real line, which is why we're allowed to right maximum there. And so the part of the theorem that we had done uh, is this. So we proved uh, that we defined uh, alpha to be the infimum of the unit vectors of Tf and product F, and beta to be the supremum of the same, um, that uh, that, uh, that actually both alpha and beta uh, were in the spectrum. Okay. Now, since, uh, um, since the norm of T is pretty easily uh, the maximum here of, uh, of the negative alpha and beta, um, what does that prove to us? I think that proves um, an inequality one direction. Which way does it do it? Um, it says that the, uh, the norm of T is less than the, the max of the absolute value of the point in the spectrum. Okay. So, so the thing that we still need to do is to prove that uh, if lambda is some point not in this interval here, uh, then it can't possibly um, 
be in the spectrum. And that, that completes our argument, uh, because that then gives us, that should then give us the inequality the other way around. Okay. Uh, so, proving something is not in the spectrum is something we've done before. It's just uh, that we need to construct uh, a bounded inverse to the relevant operator. So we need uh, t minus lambda i has a bounded inverse. And the way we do that is by applying that lemma that we proved last time. We proved this by showing that it's bounded below. Now, if you remember, uh, that lemma that converted being bounded below into having a bounded inverse required that both the operator and its adjoint were bounded below. But uh, those two things that we need to show coincide in this case, because um, the, because what? Um, because of course, T is self adjoint by assumption in the theorem, and lambda is real because we're only looking at points in the spectrum because we also that thing is just self adjoint. So there's only one for each. Okay. So we just need to look at uh, t minus lambda i applied to f. It's calculated squared norm uh, to uh, just make the, the algebra a little bit easier. And uh, then to do this, we use the following estimate. So we can write this as uh, tf minus just some number times f plus that number times f minus lambda times f. Okay, we're just uh, putting that inside there and then just use um, Not, not quite the triangle inequality because we're squaring things, I guess. Pythagoras, cosine, whatever, whatever it's called. Uh, and just split up these terms separately. And so we get um, t minus the scalar uh, times f, all squared. And then, of course, everything over here, this is just some scalar times f. And uh, f is a unit vector. So um, we can just, uh, oh, well, I guess we didn't say unit vector. We, F is a unit vector. Let's just say that. So take F as a unit vector. And so here we just get the absolute value of uh, Tf in the product F minus lambda all squared. And, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I don't want to use less than here at all. I don't want to. No, no. That's, that's, that's terrible. Um, yeah, so actually what I want here is to, is to use equals, because uh, what I want to say is that when we just expand out this squared norm, sorry, um, the, the, uh, the inner product of this term with that term uh, No, I'm doing something horribly wrong here. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 okay, I mean, the inner product of this term, of this stuff with this stuff, uh, you can ignore all the scalars over here, those are just scalars, uh, and the point is just that f itself is orthogonal to that difference, okay? Just calculate the inner product here, uh, so because uh, inner product of tf minus all this stuff with f equals zero. And expand out the two terms are exactly the same. So that tells you that um, the cross terms vanish and we've actually just got uh, uh, these, these vectors are actually orthogonal, so we really are using Pythagoras exactly. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, and then of course here uh, we can throw away this pesky term at the beginning and just keep the last term. And because of course the last term is something uh, that uh, we understand very well. Um, tf inner product f, whatever it is, is certainly in this interval between alpha and beta. And so uh, this is certainly bigger than the distance from lambda to the interval uh, from alpha 
to beta uh, all squared. And that's, of course, strictly positive. Uh, if, um, oh, sorry. If lambda is not in that interval, we're trying to show that lambda is, can, cannot be in the spectrum. So if lambda is not in that interval, that distance is strictly positive. Anyway, anyway. Okay. Any questions on what went on there? We're okay. Okay. So. Be careful this doesn't work with uh, non self adjoint operators. So T is not self adjoint. Uh, this breaks, and there's a very, very easy example. You can just use finite dimensional ones, and there's one in the notes. Uh, you just take T to be the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1. This example makes me realize something that I remember from uh, something on past analysis 3 exams, that um, I've sort of been surprised that when I have asked questions on exams that involve finite dimensional examples, like finite dimensional instances of all the theorems we've been proving, people get surprisingly confused. I'm not quite sure what to make of that, but uh, um, just don't forget to like check finite dimensional counterexamples to things and things like that. Uh, or maybe I'll try and think of uh, better advice to give. Okay, but in any case, this is obviously not self-adjoint, it's just not symmetric, uh, and one can pretty easily calculate the norm of, I mean, of course, t to the n is easy to do, it's something triangular. And you can easily calculate the norm of that, and it comes out to uh, t squared plus 1. Uh, on the other hand, what's the spectrum of this guy? Yeah, see, finite dimensional stuff is meant to be easy. This is, this is back to 11.15. Back to it's different words now, but the, the question, what is the spectrum of this operator? Is an 11:15 question. Yeah. So for a finite dimensional operator, the spectrum is exactly just the set of eigenvalues. The places where t minus lambda i is not invertible. What are the eigenvalues of this guy? So it's all one minus lambda. Oh, one, no, one, one and one. It's up a triangle. It's up a triangular. Great. Okay. It's up a triangle. Okay. So here we've certainly got the spectrum of t is just one. Okay. So uh, the max of absolute value of lambda as a spectrum is certainly one. Uh, but notice here, um, well, um, uh, and n equals sorry. one, it's root two. Yeah, so, and so all of these t to the n's all have, sorry, maybe I should have said this, that even when you look at the spectrum of t to the n, it's always just the set one, it doesn't care what's up there. But here things are going, are going horribly wrong. So the theorem that is true uh, which I think we are not going to bother proving, is that uh, this, this spectral radius, so this guy, you can see why it's called the spectral radius, hopefully, uh, is actually the limit of um, uh, the norms of t to the n's taken to the, to the 1 over n. And again, probably an 11.15 calculation. <laughs> As you take the nth roots of that, uh, it's, still, it's still converging to one, even though there's an n squared underneath. Okay, so um, we do have that in, so this is sort of all you can do uh, in the general case, but in the self adjoint case, it's nice and easy. Okay, so now we get up to the main theorem that we care about, the whole point of studying the spectrum so carefully, which is the spectral mapping theorem which just tells you that uh, taking polynomials commutes with taking spectral. So uh, this is just a statement that uh, P uh, is a polynomial, uh, and, uh, and T is bounded, there's no need for it to be self-adjoint here, uh, then uh, the spectrum of a polynomial uh, of t, so here this just means the operator we build using composition, uh, is, uh, is that same polynomial applied to whatever subset of the complex plane we got as the spectrum of the first guy. Okay, so let's prove this one. Um, so, 
we have to break into cases here because we're going to do this uh, via an analysis. Well, do we really need to? Uh, Yeah, sorry, we, we don't need to break into, break into cases. Okay, so let's let's just take some point in the spectrum. Uh, certainly, uh, um, p of x minus p of lambda uh, has lambda uh, as a root. So we can write p of x minus p of lambda as x minus lambda times q of x. For some other polynomial q. And of course, of course, all of these polynomials here are, are complex coefficients in, in all of this. Okay. Uh, well, if you've got an identity between polynomials, you can just apply that identity to some operator. Uh, and so we get that p of t, well, p of lambda is of course just some complex number. And so when we apply that to t, what we really mean is, uh, well, we're just looking at a polynomial, we've just got a constant term. So that's p of lambda times the identity, okay? And then uh, this is, uh, we can either write it as t minus lambda i times, uh, times q of t, or, I mean, these two factors here commute, so we're equally allowed to write this as q of t times t minus lambda. I. So this is actually an important principle here. Uh, when we, um, I mean, just when you take, if you've got two different operators, but we can both, I mean, operators need not com commute in general, but one very common reason for two operators commuting is actually that you can write both of them as a, as a, as a function of some other operator. In particular, you can write both of them as some polynomial of some other operator, like we can do here. Both of these operators here are polynomials in T. They necessarily commute just because the polynomials commute. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll see more of that. And it's sort of a big application in the functional calculus to do these things. Okay. Uh, well, what does this tell us? Um, so, we assumed that lambda was in the spectrum, okay? So in particular, this guy here uh, doesn't have a bounded inverse. T minus lambda i doesn't have a bounded inverse. Uh, but this tells us that uh, P of lambda uh, is in the spectrum of P of t, okay? Because uh, otherwise, uh, well, we'd have, an, we'd have an inverse to this guy. So we can write p of t minus p of lambda i all inverse. And what would that do for us? Uh, the, what does that do for us? Um, So then we could write, no, sorry, I'm actually not seeing how this final step goes. Someone sees it ill for me? No, I mean, it's meant to be that this constructs an inverse to that guy. So what could we do? Um, See how to solve with this? It feels like it would, this can't possibly work. I'm confused about this stuff. Um, Maybe the x values are like a curious or something? No, no. Yeah, I want it to work pretty easily. Um,
And what I've written is just nonsense. Mm. What I've written in the notes is clearly nonsense, but maybe it's just missing an inverse. So let's, let's add an inverse to what I have written in the notes and see if we can get that to work. So the, the, the thing that is written in the notes with possibly an inverse missing is that this thing uh, is an inverse. Oh yeah, yeah, and I think this works. Okay, sure, <laughs> that works just fine. Uh, this inverse is missing in the notes. Uh, but if you just take this guy and multiply it on the right here, uh, sorry, on, sorry, multiply it on the right here, <laughs> the t minus lambda i times q of t turns into p of t minus p of lambda i, and then it cancels with that inverse. Okay. And uh, presumably, um, you can construct an inverse on the other side by instead putting the q of t here, and then, uh, and then using this. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so then, what have we just shown? We've just shown that uh, thus uh, p of sigma of t uh, is a subset of sigma of p of t. Every point of this form is in the, is in the spectrum. Okay. So uh, in the other direction, uh, if we've got some mu uh, in the spectrum of, uh, of p of t, uh, we can try factoring uh, p of x minus mu is some constant times uh, times whatever the roots are of this particular polynomial and then just apply uh, that, that equation to t so we get p of t uh, minus mu uh, minus mu times i is c times the product uh, of t minus uh, xi, i, and again, uh, these guys in the product all commute uh, because they're all just linear functions of t. And uh, what can we do here? So, uh, so if we had every xi in the resolvent set of t, so the complement of the spectrum, uh, this would be invertible because each of the factors would be invertible. Okay, but by hypothesis, this thing isn't invertible. Therefore, at least one of the xi's is actually in the uh, uh, is in the spectrum. So we have some uh, xi k inside the spectrum. Uh, and then finally, uh, we just look at. Um, look at this, we just plug this xik back in there and we have p of xik uh, minus mu equals zero, of course, because the corresponding term vanishes over there. So mu, our point in the spectrum of p of t, really was p of something in the spectrum of t. Okay, fantastic. That, uh, that's, the, that's called the spectral mapping theorem. And the, the thing that uh, it, uh, it gives us is that, uh, I mean, a, a good way to think about this is that the, the function, let's call it uh, psi, for old time's sake, uh, what I called it in the very first lecture of, the, of this course, if you think about this thing that takes a polynomial, a complex valued polynomial, and sends it to an operator in B of H by taking a polynomial and sending it to the polynomial of our, of some fixed T, uh, so here I should say here, T bounded and self-adjoint. Uh, this is uh, norm one, uh, norm C, Norm one, in fact, in fact, much better than norm one, we can say is an isometry. Uh, uh, so in here, sorry, I need to be a little bit careful. Um, what I want to do is, um, I really should be writing here. Um, uh, 
with um, I'm thinking about this collection of polynomials as a norm space with supernorm on the spectrum. Okay, so that puts a norm on, these are all functions on the spectrum of T, so we can think about the supernorm on them. So it's an isometry, which is just saying that uh, if you look at uh, the norm of some polynomial, so we can even write that as sort of the L infinity norm on the spectrum of T, just the sup of that polynomial, uh, that's exactly equal to the, uh, the operator norm, the, that norm in B of H of, uh, of P. Okay. So the um, yeah, you can actually just calculate the norm, the norm of p of t directly from the norm of, uh, of p just as a function. So this is uh, and this is the thing that makes the continuous functional calculus work in just a moment. So, so it does occur to me that one or two of you said at the beginning that you'd missed the lecture on Wednesday and I forgot to put the lecture online. I should have actually stopped and said what the spectrum was again at the beginning of today. Yeah, <laughs> you, you worked it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we got you, you guys have worked it out. Okay, okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, why, uh, why is this true? Well, um, it's, it's actually really easy. So first of all, suppose uh, P is a real polynomial. Uh, well, then if P is a real polynomial, P of T is still self-adjoint. I mean, even if T is self-adjoint, P of T needn't be unless P is real, but that's okay. So we can say the norm of P of T uh, in B of H is uh, just the maximum over points lambda in the spectrum of P of T, the absolute value of lambda. But then by the spectral mapping theorem, that set that we're taking the maximum over is just exactly the same thing as P of the spectrum of T, oops, of lambda. So of course we can write that as the maximum over mu in the spectrum of T of the norm of uh, mu of lambda. Uh, so P of, yep, P of mu, yes, P of mu. And then hopefully uh, we're almost there. Um, uh, that, by definition, <laughs> is the uh, is the norm of p, uh, the supernorm of p on the on the spectrum. Okay, and that gave us the result there. And then um, we need one more fact. So for general p, uh, use this fact that for any uh, for any operator. The norm squared of the operator is the same as the norm of A star A. Uh, this is, I guess, something that we haven't talked about, so maybe we should stop and prove it. Um, this, is a, this is actually a very important condition. Uh, it's called the C star condition. And in fact, uh, it, so it's very important. You could just think about, um, so here this is about sort of A in, in B of H. Let me just say this without writing it. Uh, but you could imagine just thinking about some algebra, uh, which are the elements of which are just abstract things. They're not operators on some Hilbert space. They're just things that you know how to add and multiply. And you might further assume that it's a star algebra. So you've got some operation called staking star that's, that's complex anti-linear. Uh, and you might also imagine that, um, your operate, that your algebra has some norm on it that tells you the norm of every element in the algebra with the property that the norm of AB is less than the norm of A times the norm of B. So all of these things I've said so far are things that are true about B of H, but we might just imagine as sort of abstract things. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, the, the condition we might add um, is this, though, this one called the C star condition. And so algebras with all those properties, some algebra with a star and a norm and 
this, this inequality. Uh, so, so far, those things are called Banach algebras. And then when you finally add this condition, the C star condition, they're called C star algebras. Uh, we don't really have time in this course to talk about them much, but uh, that condition comes from there. But we can prove that condition uh, about bounded operators, hopefully, very easily. Let's maybe quickly do that. Um, So this thing, A star A is self-adjoint, okay? Just by taking star and seeing what happens. So we can calculate that as the soup over unit vectors of uh, um, A star A F, inner product F, and then just use the definition of the adjoint to change that to A F A F. Um, and that is exactly the supremum over these same f's, the norm of AF uh, all squared. Uh, you can then take the square outside the soup if you like. But of course, this thing here was just the definition of the norm of it. Okay. okay, so why does this help? Well, um, what we can do is take a general, so we've got now some general P that's not real valued, but uh, some complex polynomial. But we can just now calculate uh, the norm of, uh, sorry, my notes are wrong here, uh, the norm of P of T all squared. Use the C star condition to, to calculate here instead the norm of P of T star times the norm of P of T. It's easy enough to see that that's the same as the norm of P bar P uh, applied to the operator T. And now this is a real valued polynomial, so it's something times its complex conjugate, so we can apply the half of the theorem that we've already proved and see that this norm here is, uh, is the max over mu uh, in um, the spectrum of T of P bar P of mu, oops, P bar P, um, which then, um, using the fact that, um, I guess not using any fact at all, um, we can just write this as the max of uh, P bar of mu times um, P of mu. which of course is just the same. I mean, this is the norm of, a, of ZZ bar, so that's just the same, of course, as max over mu, p of mu all squared. And finally, there's one, technically one more step to move the square outside the max, I guess, to get the max. Okay, so, uh, great, the, yeah, this was the, uh, yeah, the psi preserved somewhere else. Okay. So from that now, we get to build our, uh, our continuous functional calculus. And in fact, given the order we've decided to, I decided to, I foolishly decided to do things in, in this course, we now get a lot of stuff for free. Okay, so next, uh, we define uh, a different C, let's call it B, say. Uh, from all the continuous functions on the spectrum into B of H uh, by, um, uh, well, for F, some continuous function, uh, approximate it uniformly, so in the soup norm on, an, on sigma of T uh, by polynomials. Which we can do by Weierstrass, but we 
proved on Monday that the polynomials are supernormal dense and continuous functions. Uh, and then let uh, C, uh, sorry, phi of f just be the limit. And that's taking the limit just in the norm topology. previous uh, board uh, of these pn's, okay? And the, the, the theorem we just proved a moment ago said because the pn's converge uniformly to f, the c of pn's converge in norm uh, to something, and that's what we declare um, v, of, v of f to be. Okay, now we need a few little lemmas here. Um, first of all, uh, one needs to check that uh, this is easy. Um, this answer uh, didn't depend on, on the PNs. That's a sort of very standard argument. That is, which approximating sequence we used. Uh, and now once you've got independence, it's easy to show that uh, phi uh, is an algebra homomorphism, i.e. Uh, B of f plus g, so B of f plus G of g. In my rush today, in my usual pens, uh, and uh, I'll do. And B of f times g is B of f uh, B of g. And let's even upgrade the lemma a little bit and say it's a star algebra homomorphism so that uh, phi of uh, f bar is um, phi of f star. And this, to, to see why this is true for all continuous functions f, you just need to think why it was true for polynomial functions, but that was pretty, that's not so complicated. Um, and, then, and then just, uh, and then the result extends from c the polynomial functional calculus to phi, the continuous functional calculus, uh, just because of the previous result of that, about norms. Okay, so that's great. So now any continuous function on the spectrum, we know how to take that function of an, of an operator in T. And so now here's the magic bit where uh, we get to throw out about eight pages of, uh, of the notes because the extra work that we did this year that we haven't done, that I haven't done previous years, let's just jump right over things. So now uh, what I want to do is consider um, the function uh, uh, f maps to the inner product of um, c of f acting on the vector x in a product of the vector y. So this is here is for x and y in the Hilbert space, and t, I mean, it's a bit unfortunate that t doesn't appear in the notation here. It's possible that I should have used phi subscript t. I'm sorry, this should be a phi, not a psi. Okay, but this phi really has the t encoded in it. Uh, okay, so what sort of gadget is this? Well, uh, this is, a, uh, um, uh, in fact, it's a, it's a, it's bounded even, it's a bounded linear functional on continuous functions on the spectrum of T. Now, of course, the spectrum of T is, is compact, so we might as well say compactly supported continuous functions, that makes no difference because the set is compact. And now we sort of remember what's going on, uh, which is that every, every time we have some bounded linear functional on the compactly supported functions on some space, uh, we get uh, a radon integral on sigma t. Except that I've cheated. What, what, what's the thing that I've, I've cheated? Yeah, why, why don't we get a radon integral on, on sigma of t? So the, the theorem relating, uh, well, okay, uh, 
So what I, what I should have said here is, what I meant to write here was the Burrell measure. Um, so. so I guess really the question is, why isn't this thing quite a radon measure yet? Uh, uh, sorry, why isn't this thing a radon integral? Radon integrals are meant to take, um, uh, are meant to be positive. They're meant to take positive functions to positive numbers. And we've just got no reason to expect that yet. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, this is something that we should have cleaned up a little bit earlier. But uh, uh, I briefly mentioned at least sometime this week uh, this idea of signed measures, which were just, just like normal measures, but you're allowed to take even just arbitrary complex values on sets, still meant to be counted in the additive. And this, the very slight extension of all the stuff we did about radon measures, the radon integrals and, and, and measures, was that um, uh, uh, um, oh, I really should go do this in some more detail. Okay, let's 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 say this for now. But arbitrary bounded linear functionals on CCF. No requirement uh, to be positive. Uh, give signed, in fact, finite measures on X. Right. So the thing that I'm a little bit sad about and that I wish that I'd done properly back when we were talking about uh, this stuff is that in order to drop the hypothesis that these linear functionals were positive in order to extract a measure, I've decided to put bounded back in here. And the, the basic problem is just that when we think about, when we're thinking about arbitrary positive linear functionals on compactly supported functions, we got measures that, but there was no reason for those measures to be finite measures. And now when we try and extract signed measures, we start to worrying about having to cancel in positive and negative infinity things get a little bit messy. But if you, if you stick in bounded linear functionals here, then, uh, then everything is fine and you get signed measures which are also fine. Um, uh, since I haven't actually thought very much about that issue, let me not try and say more about that now. I'll try and remember to fill in a paragraph in the notes if people want to check the details of that carefully at some point. Sorry, that's poor organization. Okay. So, okay, so the bounded linear functional that we've got from this uh, is great, and from that we get some Borel measure on a sigma of t, and so let's call that mu uh, xy, okay, because it, it did depend on these vectors, obviously, that we put in here. It's pretty easy to see that it depends linearly, of course. I mean, if I double x, uh, the measure will just be double. What it, what it was before. Okay. So now, uh, we define yet another functional calculus. We've already used, I guess we used C for the polynomial one and phi for the continuous one. Uh, let's use omega because this is the last functional calculus we'll ever need. Uh, um, the functional calculus uh, for, I think we can just say Borel measurable function. On, uh, on sigma of t, uh, as follows. So omega of f, well, uh, this is meant to give us some operator, but I'm not gonna tell you exactly what the operator is. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you what all of its inner products are, what all of its, sorry, what all of its actions on vectors interproduct with other vectors are, I'll specify all of these numbers. And, uh, if I can specify a huge collection of numbers like this for each x and y, and the, that collection of numbers is linear with respect to y and anti-linear with respect to x, so I mean, that defines some, um, some linear operator. Uh, we separately need to check it's bounded, but okay, one thing at a time. Let me define these numbers first. Uh, we'll say that these numbers should just be the integral over sigma of t of this function, f, uh, d mu, one. Okay, and so then the claim is uh, 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 
there is a well. Um, how to say it? Uh, it specifies uniquely. linear operator uh, and uh, if f uh, is bounded on the spectrum of t omega of f uh, is a bounded Basically, I mean, you can sort of see exactly what happens. Um, we want to, um, to to check that this is implicitly defining some bounded linear operator. We want to take a supremum here over all x and y of norm one, and um, if f is bounded, then we can just pull out the uh, uh, we can just in this integral just pull out f f uh, pull out the, the the, the bound for f here, and then we just have to take the supremum of the volumes of all of these measures here, and um, why is that bound? Um, okay. Maybe we can come back to that. Finite? Yeah, the problem is that each mu x y is finite. But here, if we were, if we were calculating the norm of uh, uh, of omega of f, we have to take the supremum over x and y on the on the unit sphere, and so we need to need a little bit more than that. Okay, so we're almost out of time because I'm making deeper and deeper methods for myself. Uh, but we do need to do a little bit more work here because um, while this is, if I've got the details straighter for you, um, this is some very succinct description of how you construct these operators omega of f. But we'd like to actually be able to compute them. I mean, if I give you, um, like if I give, if I give you functions like f is the characteristic function from negative infinity to lambda. We'd like to get our hands better on what that operator actually is in terms of, in terms of t. Uh, and it's sort of, it's pretty hard from this point of view to see what on earth, how you would ever calculate what this operator is and what it does. Uh, and you can calculate these inner products at various points individually, but it's not, it's not really the most satisfactory, satisfactory answer. So, what we will do, so I'll just sort of advertise this statement that we'll have to get to next time. So we'll define uh, uh, the notion of a positive operator um, which we'll always write yeah? a greater than or equal to zero. And then the thing that we're going to do is we'll show uh, if um, if you've got some sequence of operators converging downwards to A, so converging downwards in the sense that the successive differences are negative operators, I mean, the, the, which just means that negative is a positive operator, um, uh, in uh, just, con uh, in, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. What we'll, we'll show is that if Fn is converging downwards to F, uh, with Fn all continuous functions on the spectrum, uh, then when we look at the um, continuous functional calculus applied to these Fn's, we get a whole bunch of operators. Okay? We'll show that these converge downwards in the sense that the differences of these are positive operators uh, to something. And uh, um, assuming, well, this F, of course, is still very well measurable because it's a, this pointwise downwards limit of continuous functions, so f is, is Borel measurable. And, uh, and in fact,
then what ends happening is that these guys are, uh, oh, <sighs> sorry, this is not true. This is only converging with a strong topology. Okay, and let me come back to that point in just a second. The point is these phi fn's are, uh, are converging downwards, but only in the strong sense to uh, this crazy uh, real measurable functional calculus. So this is actually what we do to do computations. You want to take some function that's not continuous of your, of your operator. Well, you approximate it as a pointwise decreasing limit of continuous functions uh, when you can do that, and not all real things are there, but everything in practice you want to deal with is in there. Uh, and then you just use the continuous functional calculus from those, which remember you did by approximating thing, continuous functions by polynomial functions, and you compute the strong limit. And you get, we've talked about on the assignments what the strong limit of a sequence of operators is, so you already know everything about that. Okay, that's next time. Um, sorry about the mess things were today. Uh, the, what's in the notes, if you uh, want to be reading the notes that we sort of skipped over today, is um, uh, directly building the Borel functional calculus uh, by, first of all, mucking around with all the gory details here, um, which somehow, the way we've done the course this time, got packaged into that business about the relationship between radon integrals and radon measures. So yeah, things are a bit different from what's in this. OK, see you next time. Thank you. Um, really quick announcement, guys. Anybody who might be interested in taking part in a international maths competition that has significant prize money involved potentially, um, on Saturday fortnight, no good, <laughs> no good for people running <laughs> because it would be dead that day. Um, it's like two three hour papers, one in the morning, one in the afternoon of the Saturday. And yeah. I'm about to send out emails at some point in the next couple of days. I need to have entry lists sorted by <laughs> like next Wednesday or something. So this is all very last minute. This thing does have actually quite significant prize money. I mean, like there's five thousand for the first for, for whoever wins the competition across thirty-four universities who are taking part. It's only for undergraduates. Yeah, um, like I thought there was even more than that actually, but maybe that's right. There's also money for the university that puts in like yeah, team, the top, team money as well. There's the ability things. to enter as pairs, although the number of pair entries we're going to be able to accept at ANU is probably fairly limited because of the need to supervise mm. the exams. But we want a couple to crack. The reason I've walked into this 